So welcome. Um, like to have you just take a moment and enjoy this photograph from uh, Sherry. This is one of those pictures that I can just spend uh, a huge amount of time just studying and looking how far back it goes into the woods here uh, with the green. And uh, I, I'd love to have this as a puzzle. I told Sherry we should take this, send it to the puzzle company, and make a custom puzzle for all of our friends and family. So thank you, Sherry, for this lovely, lovely picture. It's just the lighting is just exceptional on the trees, the green moss on them. Uh, just, uh, you can see we're on the coast here, a uh, touch of that uh, humidity that out here in the desert we don't experience often. So thank you, Sherry. All right, let's get into our conversation today. This is a little bit of a play on word, on words. Um, uh, the advantage of having an angry God. So our first four slides or so are gonna just be a bit of a spoof. Uh, it says that you can have an angry God too. Now, why would I say such a ridiculous thing? Because there are so many Christians who believe God is a, an angry God that, well, let's just get into this. I, I'm going to just highlight some of the problems of an angry God, but then I want to contrast that to the beauty of the gospel. So let's go on this journey together. All right. There could be with an angry God, a lightning bolt for everyone who gets out of line. 50,000 millivolts a second, somewhere in that neighborhood. Zap. Some people believe that's God when people are bad. We could make a list of who God does not like so we cannot like them as well. Do you think God only likes the people you like? There's a lot of Christians who actually believe that. We could use his anger for fear to make people do what is right. Don't you know he hates sinners and he's going to make them burn forever and ever? Well, that's the next slide, actually. We could worship a God who tortures sinners for eons over and over so we can torture people as well. Process that. Think about that. Does God only like the people we like? Does that give us license to be unkind and hateful to others? Seriously? The church is at a crossroads right now. It is huge. We have some challenges in Christianity. We need to write and write away, need to fix them. Let's take a moment and look at the gospel. We can experience the truth of a loving God this is the lamb picture of God. That was the Old Testament picture of the lamb. Now met and fulfilled in Christ, our sins from cause to effect caused us to face the penalty of rebellion and sin, which is death. And who took our penalty? Who took our sin? You know, Jesus isn't paying some debt to the devil. devil. God doesn't owe the devil a thing. Jesus isn't appeasing an angry God. Jesus is taking your penalty and mine and resolving the sin problem. He's entering into the second death, the eternal death, raising and defeating that death for us and then gifting us freely eternal life. Our cause had an effect on what Jesus was willing to do for us. You see, God in Christ did for us what we could not do for ourselves. His love is balanced with mercy and justice, not vindictiveness or anger. God acts with agape love to set us free from our sin. That's what recovery from faith gone bad looks like and sounds like. He is our atoning lamb. That means he's reconciled us. He is our substitution. He is our or was our punishment and he is our life. We are free to unite our lives in his life every day. Notice in Galatians to the church of Galatia who had gone back to legalism. Listen to the counsel that was written for them. I have been crucified with Christ, Paul says. It's no longer I who live 
but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me, loved me, agapied me, and gave himself up for me. The act of the cross was for me, and for Paul, and for you, and for every human being on the planet. No exception. Isn't that beautiful? He is the door opener for sinners to have a relationship restored with the Father. We are the cause. He experienced the consequences. He gives us a new life in Him, healing us. You see, that is the true healing model. Because His healing us from the brokenness of our sin and giving us His gift of His righteousness, His beautiful life, He pours into us His unconditional agape love. And that heals us from the damage of sin and from the brokenness of living on a planet filled with rebellion and sin. Do we perpetuate a distortion of God's love by our acts of judgmentalism, acts of inflexibility, acts of criticizing, acts of anger, and the list could go on indefinitely? Do we distort God's love by our behavior? You see, there are Christians that perceive God as angry with gay people, so he sent AIDS, a plague, AIDS, to straighten them out or to judge them or to condemn them. The only problem is it isn't just one group of people. That affects men, women, and children all over the planet. But you see the distortion? Well, God's just zapping those bad people. Now listen carefully. Adultery is far more widespread as is the abuse of children or spouses, and may I say, especially among Christians, which is hugely destructive. So why does God not send a plague on the people who do such things, impose such violence on each other and children? You see, if he just singles out a particular group of people and lets all the other people's behavior be ignored, wouldn't that make an unfair God? Wouldn't that make an angry God? An unjust God? Is it because we think God hates those we hate and therefore it's his vengeance? Are we supposed to present this kind of God to the world? Is that why the church exists? My last presentation, I said you will begin to pick up a theme. I want you to, again, listen to what Matthew had to say, quoting Jesus. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, listen carefully. This has become the drumbeat of a new Christian nationalism in America, but does it fit with true Christianity? And if it fits with your Christianity, you want to be exceedingly careful because we're going to continue the passage. Jesus said, however... I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you so that you may be the sons of your Father who is in heaven. Just the opposite, isn't it? See, there's this new kind of Christianity that's emerging that is a contradiction to the life of Christ. Continuing in the passage, for he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others, secular people? Do not even Gentiles do the same, Jesus says? Now, the complicated passage. Therefore you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. The perfection of our heavenly Father was his impartiality to all people. See, that word perfect means to be mature. The maturity, divine maturity of God sees every person as a person having infinite value, a direct contradiction to what is happening in contemporary Christianity today. The perfection of the Father was in his unprejudiced, impartial kindness and generosity with his Son, with his reign on all kinds of people. We are called to such a holiness in God. 
to a love that supersedes man's love, to experience the Father's love as ambassadors in Christ, to manifest impartiality, not an angry God, but one who moves us with his mercy. This is the fulfilling of the divine love, love to God and love to your neighbor. Paul put it this way in 1 Thessalonians. May the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people so that he may establish your hearts without blame in holiness. Remember I, I said there is a call to the holiness of the Father. Without blame in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all of his saints. Do you know how to become blameless? Is you let the increase of agape love flow into you and have that love of God for all people so that you are without blame in the holiness of the Father. Well, that's the end of our presentation. That's an awful lot in a very short period of time. These are profound words. These are not my words. I, I am not making these words up. I am not misinterpreting them at any level. I am just simply sharing them with you so that the Holy Spirit can lift your eyes up to see a higher path in contemporary Christianity today. Because Christianity is beginning to go down a low road of hate, partisanship, violence in the name of Jesus. And it's not coming, it's already here. Division is the fingerprints of Satan. Unity is the fingerprints of the Holy Spirit. Who is in charge of your life? Who is the king that you worship? Are you experiencing the Father's impartiality, which is a demonstration of His holiness to all people? That is the purpose of what the church is called for, called to. Are we with the Father? Are we truly 100% ambassadors? Are we out for our opinion and our own rightness? The church is at a crossroads, which means you may be at a crossroad. Ponder that. Oregon Coast is our last picture. Thank you, Sherry. That cave that you can see how the water is worked away at that cave washed out, that kind of pastel green ocean. You know the color of water reflects the color of the sky and when you have a gray sky that ocean becomes kind of that pastel bluish green color. Even the sand picks up some of those colors in there. Uh, look at the life bursting forth on top of those rocks. I just enjoy so much the ministry Sherry has and the, and the work that she just captures that moment in time and we can just take a moment and enjoy her blessing. Thank you, Sherry. I hope you have a really blessed day. Go back and look at those scriptures again. Study them. Let it become part of your own Christianity. Blessings. Take care. We'll see you again.